seen since desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there wasn't a building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. If I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done. We're talking today with Jim Hunter of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, now, Jim, can you begin with some background on yourself and start with uh, where and when were you born? I was born here in Grand Rapids um, and uh, grew up in Grand Rapids. I went to St. James grade school, West Catholic High School. And okay, what year were you born? I was born in 1946, okay. in July. And what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? Uh, my mother was a stay-at-home mom at that time, which was typical, I guess. And my dad sold uh, Kendall motor oil eventually for 50 years. And uh, uh, we remained in, in the Grand Rapids area that whole time. Okay. And how many kids were in your family? I have two uh, sisters and one brother. Uh, all uh, in the area, um, uh, a sister that lives in Florida half time of the year. Okay. All right. Uh, so what year did you finish high school? I graduated from West Catholic uh, in 1964, which was the first graduating class out of West Catholic at that mm -hmm. time. Okay. And what did you do after you finished high school? Well, uh, <laughs> Decided uh, a friend of mine and I were going to uh, try Grand Valley, which was new at that time. So, uh, as it turned out, uh, Allendale campus was a series of four buildings, I believe, at that time. So, or maybe five. Uh, we uh, we both went to Grand Valley for one year um, in '65. Now, was that were you like the second year it was open? Is that? I believe okay. it was the second year. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't much going on mm -hmm. out there, but it was uh, compared to today. All right. Uh, and at that point, were they running a fairly traditional liberal arts curriculum with regular classes? or? Yeah. I, uh, some of the uh, courses I took uh, were German, one and two, and, and I, I had uh, uh, philosophy and, and uh, uh, history. Uh, uh, Western civilization, I mm -hmm. believe it was. A very tough professor. Might have been one that changed my mind about sticking it out at Grand Valley at that time. Um, but it wasn't uh, an unpleasant experience. Uh, it was. Uh, I lived on the west side of Grand Rapids, so it wasn't a terribly long drive out mm -hmm. there. All right. Uh, but basically, after a year, you decided, okay, you didn't really want to stick with that? Yeah. Um, we uh, uh, hung around uh, with my best friend and, and some others, uh, um, most of which were still in college, going to head for their second year. And a friend of mine and I, my best friend and I, uh, uh, decided we were going to join the Marine Corps. There wasn't any doubt about it. Didn't tell our mothers. Just went and enlisted and uh, caught yes. hell afterwards uh, when they found out. But. Um, well, you were old enough, so once we you signed up, you're in. Raised my right hand, right. Okay. So when did you do that? When did you enlist? That was in February 1966. Okay. So by then, Vietnam had been going on for about a year. Yeah. And how much did you know about that? Or were you thinking about that when you enlisted? I, I knew a little bit about it, but I, I was more, um, I, I think, uh, in tune with uh, a friend of mine who um, was a Marine and, and uh, of course, the the blues and the you know the pride and tradition uh, were a big part of it. Uh, not so much uh, the possibility of of going to war, but we knew it existed, so we signed up. All right. Uh, and, and then when did they have you start training? Uh, it would have been in in the spring. I, I believe it was uh, um, early, uh, late March, early April or so. It would have been March. Mm -hmm went to San Diego for basic training and and then uh, stayed there for uh, advanced infantry training. Okay. Now, uh, when you went out to San Diego, did you just fly out by yourself or how'd that work? Flew out by myself uh, and uh, uh, that was traumatic uh, being met uh, in San Diego by a uh, Marine Corps representative and, and uh, you quickly began to 
to notice that life was going to change uh, as you were um, boarded a bus and, and taken to the uh, recruit uh, depot in San Diego. And this was uh, like most of those uh, late night arrival and, and uh, a lot of yelling, screaming, do this, do that. Uh, you're not doing anything right and blah, blah, blah. Now, now, where does the yelling actually start? Is it in the airport, on the bus, once you get there? Uh, once you board that bus, you're, you're pretty well uh, 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 taken uh, into a, a new uh, uh, life, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, because they do yell. At that time, they screamed. The profanity was, I, I mean, I, much more advanced than I've ever heard at that at that time, and and it was hurry up, do this, do that. Once you got to the training facility, it it became um, a little worse. Uh, no physical harm or anything like that, but uh, they scared you to death. And and once you made those yellow footprints in in San Diego that you had to stand on, um, you you began to wonder why you did this. How much of that were you expecting? Uh, none of it, so to speak. I, I really was uh, uh, naive as to, uh, I knew it would be tough. Uh, I played football in high school and, and other sports. I mean, I, I wasn't um, uh, not expecting a physical uh, challenge, but the mental uh, challenges uh, of being screamed at day and night and, and uh, uh, literally at that time and you realize it afterwards they break you down before they build you up and so we were uh, shaved our heads were shaved our, our clothes were sent home um, uh, yellow sweatshirts and and uh, uh, red shorts and and uh, uh, not much else at that time and uh, and uh, then the training really began the, the following day Okay, and what did that consist of? Well, in, uh, at that time, uh, the recruits were living in in Quonset huts in San Diego. There were no barrackses. A Quonset hut, I forget how many men or guys uh, were in there, probably 20, 25, and, and uh, drill sergeants were uh, introduced to you uh, early on that, that dark morning and and uh, they came by way of banging on garbage cans and and reveille and all, the whole the whole bit so it was kind of traumatic uh, in a way I look back and smile because um, I know other guys you know went through that same thing uh, I'm not sure you know what it's like today um, with all the political correctness of, of uh, uh, training um, men and women, but uh, at that time they, they got you up and uh, you better be where you're supposed to be uh, or else. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, and then in terms of the training regime itself and the boot, the boot camp part, um, how much is physical, how much is classroom or? Uh, well, there's a lot of, a lot of physical. I, I, I'd have to say, looking back, it was more physical. Uh, but there was quite a bit of classroom work on, on the traditions of the Marine Corps and not so much on uh, um, uh, uh, the, the tactics or anything like that, but the tradition, terminology, you carried a little red notebook with you. I still have mine. It did come back on one of my sea bags and I looked at those notes and I'm, I'm just smiling as mm -hmm. I am now about what I was writing down. But. Um, we did uh, have various classes uh, that was always a um, kind of a breather, so to speak, that you didn't have to go out and do 500 squat thrusts, you didn't have to run, you didn't have to climb ropes, you didn't have to do uh, a lot of uh, physical um, training. Mm -hmm. Though, uh, you know, it was uh, certainly, uh, um, in retrospect, a whole lot easier than what I was going to find later on in in uh, Vietnam, so. Right, okay. Now, did you kind of adjust to that? I mean, by the time you got out of boot camp, had you kind of figured it out, or did you just survive it? Uh, no, you, you learn to adjust. And I, like I say, I played sports in high school, and I, I kind of enjoyed some of the, the challenges. I, I, I watched a lot of guys sweat it. I mean, kids that, that, that you know, really weren't physically um, 
uh, prepared for this, uh, but most of us you know, made it. There were a few that I think were sent to motivational platoons and and uh, and or uh, were discharged. But I I kind of enjoyed it. Towards the end, you you felt much more comfortable. Uh, the drill instructors, as you progressed at various stages of your training, they they gave you a little bit more respect and and the pride thing started. To, to, to show up. Right. Now, uh, did you have the sense that most of the guys you were with at that stage were enlistees? I, I think just about all of them were enlistees at that time. I, I know that we had some reservists, uh, two-year mm -hmm. reservists that, that were in there as well that knew they were going to get out, uh, you know, once their training was done and go back home. But uh, for the most part, I, I believe uh, just about everybody was not enlisted. Yeah, the, the drafting of, of Marines, which did happen, was mostly a little bit later, because you're still fairly early yeah. in the Vietnam sequence at this point, in the spring of 66. Okay, so how long was the boot camp? Uh, I want to say 10 weeks, 9 or 10 weeks. Okay. Um, and then your next step is? The next step was uh, ITR, and it was called Infantry Training Regiment, Regiment. Yeah. and and during uh, later in the boot camp process, you were uh, tested as well, and and uh, um, most of the most of the Marines uh, were uh, became O three elevens or infantry grunts, mm -hmm. as I was, and uh, some of them, uh, the good looking kids, went to sea school um, and got embassy jobs eventually and things like that but uh, at that time I think the Marine Corps knew they they needed uh, boots on the ground as they call them today and and so most uh, most of us uh, were 0311 uh, infantry okay. some artillery some mortars and machine gunners and so on but most uh, straight out infantry all right and where do they do the ITR that uh, that was at Camp Pendleton um, in uh, Southern California, not too far from San Diego. Uh, there are several camps at, at Pendleton, um, pretty rugged in the mountains, some of them. Uh, I was at uh, Camp Pulgas, which was up one of the long trails and, and pretty, pretty bare bones uh, facility. It wasn't a Quonset hut, but it was a concrete barracks-like place. And uh, we learned a lot of uh, tactical um, uh, things at, uh, at ITR. And uh, our shooting uh, progressed, and, and um, we learned uh, survival tactics and, and, and doing things that eventually would, would become second hat. Okay. Uh, to what extent was this geared toward Vietnam at this point? Well, we all knew, you know, where we were going to go by then, um, especially if you were in O three eleven. Um, some of the some of the guys, uh, my my best friend that I went in with, he he moved on to uh, avionics school, a Navy facility in Memphis, and uh, so we we said goodbye to each other. Uh, actually, for the last time, I didn't know it. At, well, no, it wouldn't have been the last time, but mm -hmm. for for quite a while and. And uh, some of the some of the guys uh, went to uh, various other other schools, but those of us that were were uh, infantry grunts were were uh, pretty well uh, uh, we pretty well knew where we were going. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and how long was the ITR? You know, I don't remember. Uh, it wasn't as long as boot camp. Mm -hmm. uh, it might have been six weeks or or maybe a little bit longer. And um, uh, I, it, it was quite grueling because the the runs got longer. The the runs were 10 miles, 20 miles. Um, the, the the physical training out in the ocean on the ship, uh, the climbing the ropes and things like that all became more um, more difficult. Uh, but uh, physically, uh, we were a lot stronger and were able to, to do things we never thought we could do. And did they treat you a little bit differently in ITR than they had in boot camp? Oh yeah, yeah. You were, once you finished boot camp, you were you were Marines, mm -hmm. and uh, um, and you don't get that designation until you're 
you know, your last week in, in uh, boot camp. And so the, um, the, the training instructors were, were all, for the most part, to my knowledge or recollection, were uh, Vietnam veterans at that point. And they, of course, shared some of the stories and knew, knew exactly what they needed to teach us to, mm -hmm. to survive uh, what was to come. So it was tough, but it, 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 we were treated much better. All right. Now, you mentioned training on ships. What were you doing on ships? Well, it was, uh, I don't even remember what it was. It was uh, climbing ropes and, and disembarking, I guess, is a term from a ship, mm -hmm. though I never did that in, pr in practice. Yeah. But uh, climbing into a landing craft or something like no, that? No, it was simply uh, going uh, from a landing craft up ropes and okay. then coming down into the water and um, uh, and onto a barge or something like that. Uh, in retrospect, they could have spent their time better on uh, more things that were, we were going to be facing. Did you work with Amtrak's at that point or not? No. Okay. No. All right. So uh, you get your orders at the end of ITR. Or how does that work? Yeah, I got my orders to to report back to. I, I got some leave and report back to to uh, Camp Pendleton, which I did do, and um, uh, it was called a staging battalion. Uh, it was a third staging battalion. I think it was two weeks of kind of processing, getting medically uh, checked. Uh, I don't think we got. Maybe we got shots at that point. I don't remember now. Um, and, and signing uh, wills and things like that. Uh, paperwork. Uh, and uh, once uh, that was finished, uh, then they bust me to, bust us to um, El Toro, uh, which was a, a marine air facility in California. Um, and I visited there once. Um, and we got on a commercial airliner and off we went to Vietnam via Hawaii mm -hmm. for refueling. Now while you're either in the staging unit or earlier, were they trying to teach you anything about Vietnam itself, society, culture, that kind of thing? Um, you know, I don't really remember. I, I don't, if, if they did, I don't recall it. I think it was uh, kind of the hurry up and wait mm -hmm. mentality of, of probably all the services and just get ready you know uh, pack your bags you can only take this you got to send this home or wherever okay. uh, more administrative uh, stuff than right. than training okay and and uh, what was it like going back home before you went to Vietnam uh, well my my girlfriend who was my wife now is uh, was a big part of that uh, you know, I don't remember parties. I, I remember getting acquainted with friends who were still in college. And uh, the, the last thing I remember is going to the beach in Grand Haven with my girlfriend, who is now my wife, and, and, and listening to music. And, and uh, I, I remember it was kind of a quiet, somber time more than a, more than a, a, a have fun time. Mm -hmm. Had your parents gotten used to the idea of you doing this? Yeah, they did. They did. Uh, I think they were proud of proud of me, uh, but they weren't real happy with where I was going to be going. Right. Um, and as a matter of fact, my dad was a, a member of the local draft board here in Grand Rapids at the time, so he was hearing a lot of the heart. Uh, uh, well, he was hearing a lot of stories. Right. You know, so he probably knew more than he told my mother, and and uh, but. Uh, we said our goodbyes and love yous and mm -hmm. back okay. to California. All right. Now, the, was this a chartered commercial jet you were on? So it'd be like all Marines on it? Or? Yeah. It, it was all Marines. I forget if it was, I think it was United maybe or, or whoever they contracted with. I don't remember. But it was a jet. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at that time it was 707. And um, Took off. Uh, it was a long flight. Stopped in Hawaii. We got to get off the plane a little bit and just look around on the tarmac. We mm -hmm. couldn't, you know, but we were in Hawaii and then uh, loaded back up and off we went to, to Vietnam. Uh, arrived in Da Nang. Don't remember what day it was. Do you remember what time of day it was? Uh, was it day or night? No, it was day. And. Uh, 
uh, whether it was morning or I, th I think it was late morning or mid morning. Mm -hmm. I, I I remember exactly the you know walking off the plane as all Marines and Army anybody that went there the the heat and the smells hit you first big time. All right, and then what do they do with you as you get off the plane? Well, I scream at you and tell you where to go. Uh, a lot of noise in Da Nang. It was a, a major um, facility for Marine aircraft and, and uh, Air Force aircraft, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think every 10 minutes uh, an F-4 took off for either a bombing run or, or support for Marines up north. Uh, it was noisy. There was no way to sleep. I uh, spent one night in a, in, a, in a plywood building, like a, I wouldn't call it a barracks, it's a, more of a shed, mm -hmm. one night with a bunch of Marines and got up early and told, they told us to line up and there were probably 100, 200, I think it was in two, two rows, and they gave you your, your orders, who okay. you were going to be assigned to. And who were you assigned to? Well, I, I like every third man, was assigned to the 9th Marines and uh, 2nd Battalion 9th Marines. I didn't realize why at the time, but I do now. Um, they were taking a lot of casualties and needed a lot of replacements. Mm -hmm. So about every third guy who was either going to um, 1st Battalion, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Battalion, 9th Marines. All right. Because that's a regiment that at some point acquired a nickname of Walking Dead, or at least that's been yeah. a, people who've been in different battalions in that, that right. regiment have mentioned that. Right. Yeah. And where were they based at that time? Well, um, my trek was um, with, a, with the 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines. They put us on a um, C-130, I think it was, transport, where the back opens up, and we flew. It wasn't a long flight. They uh, let us out in, in Dong Ha. And Dong Ha was a forward marine base um, in I Corps in northern, uh, the northern part of South Vietnam. And uh, it was kind of traumatic because when that rear opened, the plane never stopped. It just kind of glided down and they told us to get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, and find a find a trench on either side of the runway to, to get into uh, because they, they were getting mortared most of the time mm -hmm. and when a plane came in there were people trying to mortar that plane. Um, bad guys. So, uh, And uh, the amazing part, it wasn't until we got to Dong Ha that they issued uh, rifles and uh, web gear, ammunition, um, and all the things you needed. And what's more amazing is where they got that stuff from. There were big piles of, of uh, belts, canteens, uh, ammunition, uh, um, and you were assigned a rifle that was relatively new at that time, but all the web gear, all the stuff in the piles was from Marines who were either going home uh, without harm or Marines that, that were injured or killed and they threw it in a pile. Mm -hmm. So you got to go pick your canteens and got to pick your, your gear, what flak, kind of, flak jackets. Yeah. Now did you have uh, jungle boots at this point or did you have leather boots? Or? No, we had leather boots at that, mm -hmm. that point. I eventually got jungle boots but uh, the leather boots pretty much deteriorated like everything else on your body, your clothes. Right. And the rifles, did you have M16s by this time or still M14s? No, M14s. All right. So we got to go out and, and sight in and get acquainted and get ready. All right. Uh, what most of us did, uh, the sling was underneath. We reversed the sling so we could shoulder the weapon like this with the sling. Uh, which worked out better because you're carrying a, a lot of other gear with you. Okay. Now, how long did you spend at Dong Ha? Uh, it wasn't long. Uh, I remember um, some patrols. They get you acquainted uh, getting out on some patrols, uh, not too far out. Um, 
getting out on on uh, um, uh, listening posts, which later on became a pretty scary thing. Um, so they were getting acquainted to the to the scenery, but uh, most of what you were doing was uh, the heavy lifting for the for the unit. Uh, the new guys got to uh, load and unload ammunition, load bodies, do things that that. Uh, the the old timer the salts there were were not not required to do at that time so so you'd come in and you would join a particular company but then a platoon and, and a squad within that right right okay and what kind of reception do you get when you join your unit uh, it's not you know they're not welcoming you know they're glad to have you but they you know as I learned and and I saw the guys that came in behind me, uh, they're skeptical that you might do something stupid to cause their death or injury. And um, so they, you know, they weren't there to shake your hand as much as just be glad there was another warm body to, to man a trench or a foxhole or go out on a patrol with. I was assigned to the uh, Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines, 3rd Platoon. All right, and then once with them, well, what kind of activities were they engaged in when you joined them? Uh, they, the, the company had just finished a, a rather lengthy um, uh, move uh, around uh, Dong Ha, so they got uh, like three or four days rest, so that meant uh, not much was going on for three or four days, but then uh, we saddled up and, and uh, moved by foot to uh, Cam Lo, which was even uh, somewhat further north uh, uh, between uh, uh, Dong Ha and, and, and what was North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So we spent some time in Cam Lo doing patrols, um, um, manning um, perimeters. Every third night was a combat patrol. Every second night was an uh, uh, ambush. Uh, no, I think I got that wrong. Perimeter combat and ambush patrols. So you, you got into it pretty quickly. Um, and we were on the move quite a bit. Um, uh, and, and from that point on, uh, the moves were uh, through the jungle and up high into the mountainous areas. Okay. The area right around Camlo itself, was that a little bit more open country? Or? It was open, semi-flat, as I recall. Uh, you could see the mountains um, in the distance. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, the big one of the big problems was it rained nearly all the time, and and uh, uh, you never seemed to get dry. Uh, some of your patrols were through the dikes and paddies and and in the jungle and, and uncomfortable. Right. And what kind of enemy activity was there? At first, not too much. Uh, mortars every now and then. Uh, some of the uh, combat patrols, uh, we uh, had some contact. Um, ambushes early on, uh, uh, not you know nothing big. You know we saw people, but but not to the point that you were going to let loose on them. Um, and and uh, listening posts, uh, which to me was the one of the hardest things to do because you heard absolutely everything, bugs, uh, animals, um, you never knew what it was and, and and staying awake in a listening post was critical. You had a radio and clicks for activity, radio checks. And on a listening post, how far away would you be from the rest of the unit? Uh, anywhere from a hundred meters. Uh, uh, I guess I'd be a roughly 100 yards, mm -hmm. 150 yards out. Sometimes a little longer, sometimes a little shorter, depending on the terrain. Mm -hmm. And was it totally dark at night? or? Uh, uh, well, yes and no. It was pitch dark, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there was an awful lot of, of activity in the distance where you would see the flashes, you would see the bangs, um, you would see the... the, the um, flares going up and then uh, at times you, you would see their 
uh, the NVA's um, tracers coming at you, and of course they could see ours. So, mm -hmm. um, but uh, a lot of times uh, there, it, it, like you say, it mostly rained, so there wasn't a lot of starry nights. Right. It was pretty dark. Mm -hmm. So aside from the whatever flashes of shooting was going on, but you didn't have starlight or moon, you didn't moonlight or things like that very often no. to see by. No. And of course, there's no ambient light because there's not a lot of no. people with lights on and things. You wrote letters by a little candle in a hole and trying to make sure you weren't reflecting any light out. All right. Now, you say you moved up in, into kind of hill country and jungle country pretty quickly. Uh, and as you get far, were you were you in monsoon season when you got there or was that over? No, it, it, monsoon season came later. Mm -hmm. I think it was August, September, October. So this was just regular rain? Regular rain. Yeah, it rained and it, it kind of like uh, uh, if you have ever been to Hawaii, it would rain in the morning, the sun would come out in the afternoon and it would, it would do that. And uh, uh, But uh, as, as it got later in the summer and fall, the, the rains were heavier, the monsoon rains came, and you're constantly wet, constantly cold, even though it was quite warm out. Uh, the, just the drop in temperature of 10 or 15 degrees made you cold and shiver and uh, sitting or stooping in a foxhole that was half filled with water just made it worse. All right, and, and, and when you, you wanted to sleep, I mean, what could you do to make yourself comfortable in those situations? Uh, I don't think I ever slept good, ever. I had uh, uh, the, the newness of uh, <coughs> what was going on around you pretty well kept you um, alert. You learned to be alert, so you learned to take like short naps rather than a, sleep, or a sleeping night. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is the noise often kept you from from uh, sleeping, uh, the other is incoming. Uh, you didn't sleep at all, and uh, the other for me was I had uh, uh, the you know the I guess the term is dysentery. We called it the shits for like mm -hmm. 30 days, and, and it was awful. And I had from climbing up mountain trails, literally like this, holding on to plants and trees I had got infected in my hand uh, and I couldn't I couldn't bend my my fingers uh, so I mean it, it was painful so I got I got the doc got me a shot of uh, penicillin or mm -hmm. something and I got rid of that uh, the shits eventually went away <coughs> Sorry. so uh, in terms of sleeping I, all those things uh, plus mm -hmm. the, the perimeter duty, the combat patrols, the ambush patrols, you, you, there wasn't a lot of sleep. All right. And how long did it take before um, you got into a serious firefight? Uh, I think uh, right after right after Dong Ha, uh, somewhere between Dong Ha and Cam Lo, got into a pretty bad one, uh, so bad um, that I mean, it was the first time I, I've seen um, men or Marines, you know, ripped apart. And uh, it's uh, the first sergeant, uh, who usually isn't out front, was killed. And he was like, from me to you. Mm -hmm. And he turned blue just about immediately. Um, and, I mean, uh, he had a lot of years in, and I don't know what he was doing there but he, with us, but he was killed, and a couple other guys were killed. and. And a lot of a lot of noise. I can remember being so close that they were throwing Chicom grenades at us, and I, I've had them from me to you that were duds, but you could see them and couldn't do anything about it. And you're behind a tree while a, I, I would call it a 50 caliber machine gun, but it was I think one of their 12.7 mm -hmm. machine guns were firing at us, and and this. This was right in the middle of a jungle area, and once uh, we got ourselves organized and um, they took off, um, my job, uh, along with some others as newer Marines, was to get the get the dead and wounded together. They literally had to blow a 
um, an opening in the jungle to get a medevac in. Uh, they use C4 and trees are falling all over the place so they could get them in. And, uh, it was probably the, uh, the most traumatic thing I'd seen since I got there. Uh, we had to pick up the bodies and the body parts and get them in bags and pieces are flopping out and stuff like that and get them to the area where they were going to uh, be, be taken out. So that, that was the beginning of the war for me. Because yeah. it was, it's not playing soldier at that point. No, no, no that, that's pretty no. real. Now, had you walked into an ambush? Or uh, you not really know? I, I, to this day, I don't know because we were on this ridge line in the jungle, uh, kind of on an incline here, and to our, to my right is where the uh, incoming came from, and they were pretty close. So whether they uh, they just happened to be in the area, or whether they had an ambush uh, set up, I, I don't know. I mean, they, they didn't tell us those things uh, mm -hmm. once they did their after-action reports. So, right. uh, but it was it was pretty bad, and you know, it was time to get a grip, and uh, you knew it, it wasn't for fun or it wasn't to play. Right. Now, in that situation, when the, the shooting starts, uh, do you know what to do, or do you wait for someone to tell you what to do, or just get down? Or There's a lot of screaming. Uh, we pretty much knew what to do. We were in positions that where we could, uh, we had cover to some extent. Um, we, I don't think we were prepared for that. 50 caliber or 12.6 mm -hmm. gun, that was the worst. That that was literally taking down trees that were that size. Uh, so there was not a, a lot of places to hide. Uh, but once we got our our firepower into where it was coming from, um, uh, they took off. I, I think that's I, well. I don't think I know that's where I uh, shot my first person mm -hmm. it was that close um, okay now these would be North Vietnamese regulars you were dealing with yeah yeah so they had uniforms and they had uniforms they had um, buckles with a mm -hmm. star on it yeah. and okay the older or the not older the more senior Marines ended up with the the buckles and the souvenirs so to speak mm -hmm. um, but it it, it, it was it seemed like forever, but it was quick. That's how most of those things were. Now, in terms of how the uh, more senior men in, in the unit treat you, does it change a little bit after a firefight like that, if you survive that and do okay? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, even before that, mm -hmm. they, they uh, again, they, they don't, you know, they don't look at you like their brother, so to speak, uh, but you're, you're a Marine and, and you're there to, to keep their back and they're there to keep your back and, and we learned that quickly that you had to depend on one another and uh, that was part of the training from boot camp on some mm -hmm. of the things that flash back at you are what you what you learned in in training all from. right uh, so you've gotten you get into things pretty quickly and you said that the basically that the fighting got more intense over the course the time you were there no it, it, the terrain got more intense the 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 intelligence got more intense. There was always a regiment. The 324B division is always out there, mm -hmm. and you're gonna—they're gonna find you. And uh, so our patrols met some resistance, um, uh, but they weren't anything like what I had just come out of mm -hmm. until I got to uh, Camp Carroll, and then things heated up again. And uh, those patrols um, usually made contact. Um, not large scale fights, but smaller scale fights. All right. And now, what kind of physical setting was Camp Carroll in? Camp Carroll is kind of interesting. It, you don't really notice it as you uh, as you um, walk, I'll call it, or march, or whatever, up an incline. You're always going uphill. As we headed north, you're always going up. But um, the Camp Carroll was a, a hill. It was named. Um, Camp Carroll by a, a Marine that was killed and I think he got the Medal of Honor and he named it Camp Carroll. But it, it was a strategic point because it had um, 
a big Army 175 guns. I think there were three of them on that hill that could reach into North Vietnam and, and support Marines in a lot of other places. And our job at Camp Carroll was to uh, secure the perimeter. Uh, we'd run patrols off of, off the perimeter. Uh, it wasn't bad duty. It was, you know, unless you were out on a patrol and ran into it, uh, you were semi-secure inside. You'd get mortared and, and things like that. But uh, the, the the Camp Carroll experience wasn't wasn't as bad as as some of the other um, ambushes. We set up some good ambushes out of Camp Carroll. Okay. And would the North Vietnamese actually walk into the ambushes? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like they were infinitely superior to you in terms no. of tactics or that no. kind of thing? No. Uh, sometimes in numbers they were, but, mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I wouldn't, I, I mean, they were tough, tough people. They, they weren't bad soldiers. Mm -hmm. They were tough and they were good. Uh, but, um, I, and, and frankly, our, our units, even though, uh, you know, replacements were coming in, uh, I don't think there was a Marine company in Vietnam that was at full strength. There wasn't a, uh, a platoon that was at full strength. There wasn't a, uh, a squad that was full strength. I mean, a squad uh, for, for most of what I was doing was probably eight or nine mm -hmm. Marines. Um, and so a platoon is lucky to have 30? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're always under strength, so you're always worried, you know, um, are you... Are, you know, can they overpower you simply by numbers, sheer numbers? Mm -hmm. The the one of the things that saved uh, a lot of Marines' lives was air support and artillery. Um, most of the time, if we needed it, we could get air support, and that that was usually uh, Phantoms or I think Sky Raiders mm -hmm. at that time that would you know, slower flying craft, but they they carried a lot of ammunition. Uh, but they were able to get you out of the uh, the big stuff, mm -hmm. and then marine, uh, not marine artillery so much, but marine artillery, but also uh, offshore guns uh, were sort of at at our disposal. And, and there were times I think it was the the New Jersey or one yeah. of the battleships off the coast would fire their big guns into into areas. And then the other thing is, uh, and it's it's awesome, the the B-52 strikes that um, you swear were just down the road from you, but were you know miles and miles from you, but you could feel the concussions and and hear the noise and actually walk through some of those craters that that um, uh, were from B-52s. So they they were. Uh, up there, not in direct support, but uh, in areas that they that was known uh, strongholds for NVA. Mm -hmm. Now, the time, so you're basically in, in the field from about May to December or whatever mm -hmm. uh, of 66. Were you using an M14 the whole time? M14 the whole time. And were you happy with that? Yes. Okay. For the most part. Um, um, I. I I had a little bit of luck because my dad s uh, sold motor oil for 50 years, and one of the products that he sold was for commercial use, but it was called Dry Slide. And so he would mail me in packages uh, little things of uh, Dry Slide, which were pretty good on, on the weapons. Uh, in fact, I shared a lot of it. Uh, kept kept the weapon, uh, the parts moving a little better because you're constantly in dirt and wet and and you know it doesn't take long for for a weapon to go bad. Mm -hmm. So um, I was happy with the M14, though I never got to, to to use an M16. I heard that after I was medevaced out that that uh, the unit was uh, treating in M14s, which I think a lot of a lot of Marines weren't happy with because the M14 was actually a pretty reliable weapon. Um, heavier, but more reliable. Mm -hmm. So I didn't mind it. But you didn't feel like you were outclassed by the enemy with the kind of weapons they had? Yeah, their AKs were, were pretty neat rifles, uh, weapons. Uh, captured a lot of them, and 
um, you know, just the style and the, the feel. I mean, it was a, a good good weapon. Uh, some of their other weapons weren't so great, but the AKs were good. Mm -hmm. um, our M60 machine guns were good. Got to carry the gun two or three times when when the gunner was on leave or whatever. Um, uh, puts out a lot of firepower. Mm -hmm. Now, did the Marines still have bazookas at that point, or had you gotten rid of those? Uh, I, actually, I never saw a bazooka, but what I did see and what I carried were two laws, LAW, uh, light anti-tank mm -hmm. weapons. And I guess later in, in the war, there were tanks, North Vietnamese tanks. I never saw any, but we used them to blow bunkers, mm -hmm. and they were pretty good at blowing bunkers. They were lightweight, I mean, about this yeah. long, strap on them, no problem carrying them. Yeah, just a kind of a plastic tube sort of thing? Yeah, cardboardy yeah. kind of thing. All right. Now, so you mentioned bunkers. Were there, were there a lot of bunkers or permanent places? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they did well. The, um, most of what I saw were unoccupied bunkers, but they were well constructed, well concealed, uh, big, um, some of them with hospital gear kind of things. Um, uh, unbelievable. It looks like uh, uh, a lot of time and effort was put into their bunkers compared to what we did with our foxholes and sandbags. So, uh, yeah, they, they, it's understandable why they were able to survive some of the airstrikes and, and, uh, and conceal themselves so well. Okay. Uh, now, did you have to actually assault man bunkers periodically? Never assaulted one, but blew up a lot yeah. of them. Uh, we we blew them up best we could so they couldn't be used as for their intended purpose. And a lot of them were in the, it's amazing how, what they did with some of their steps up in the jungle. I mean, you, you wouldn't, you, you don't usually take trails because they're booby trapped. But in some cases you gotta, you gotta get to where you gotta go and, and you're on these foot trails with these steps built into the side of the jungle. Amazing. Uh, it's like engineers mm -hmm. uh, doing some of this stuff. Now, how common was it to encounter booby traps? I mean, uh, pretty common. Uh, as I uh, recall, uh, uh, a lot of the injuries were, were booby trap related rather than gunfire. Okay. And what kinds of mechanisms or traps were they? Um, a lot of them were uh, sea rat cans that had a grenade inside and a and a uh, a wire or string going across the trail or an area that they thought you would uh, go through. These were probably uh, put there by locals, not NVAs. Um, there were um, the punji sticks in the holes that were prevalent. And that, to me, I, I, I saw him, I never, I, I saw one guy get pretty badly injured, but I never uh, stepped in, in an area, but they look pretty, they're crude, but bad. Mm -hmm. uh, they would put shit on them, and, and that would cause infection quickly, and so uh, that was about it. They, they, they had a reputation of, of, um, uh, I don't know how it's done, taking a, an artillery round, uh, a dud, so to speak, and converting it into a booby trap. I'm told that's yep. what I was hurt with Okay. later. All right. Uh, now, you mentioned uh, locals. I mean, was there a civilian population in the area you were patrolling? It was, it was hit and miss. There were villages, um, and, and then in between mountains, there were rice paddies, and it was pretty. Uh, and but I think the the villages were more or less controlled by by um, the Viet Cong and mm -hmm. by the NVA. They wanted their rice. They wanted their uh, uh, money, uh, so to speak. Um, and whether the, the the villagers themselves uh, put the booby traps out or or not, I, I'm sure they did. I think they had to be sympathetic to to the NVA. Mm -hmm. Now, how much contact did you actually have with the locals? Not much. I, I rarely, I could have. I mean, there were some guys that, that you know, that wanted to, to see the kids and wanted to, 
to, to try to interact in some way, give people, you know, candy or something like that. Uh, but you never, you, you really never knew um, as, uh, where we were anyway, you know, where their loyalties were. I, I s steered clear. Mm -hmm. Now, was pretty was most of your time in, in Vietnam spent kind of in the field or on these fire bases? All of it. So you're not really in any place. I mean, some place like Dong Ha might have a larger village next to it or something, but yeah, it, it was the boonies is the mm -hmm. true term. It was truly the boonies, and what was in between any of the villages were mountains, jungles, you know, the tri so-called triple canopy, no civilization other than animals, snakes, and bugs. Mm -hmm. Um, and NVA, and and so there there wasn't a whole lot of um, time or opportunity, I guess, to interact with people. Right. It, it wasn't populated. Okay. Now, when you're patrolling or moving around in the jungle, would you move in a company-sized unit or by platoon, or how would you do that? Both. Some company operations, some uh, platoon-sized operations, but mostly um, squad and and. and uh, maybe 12 to 15 guys at most. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'd have, uh, you'd always have a corpsman with you. Sometimes you'd have uh, mortar guys with you. Uh, you'd always have a machine gunner with you. Um, but uh, most of them were smaller operations. Uh, when the company moved, it was noisy, a lot of clang and banging. And I mean, you couldn't be very stealthy at that time. Yeah, I mean, you got canteens, you got ammunition, you got weapons, you got lots of noise. So. And the company went together. Was that kind of a larger scale operation to be part of? Or? Yeah, yeah. There were a couple of them that were 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 larger um, platoons um, within the companies were semi spread out. You weren't in a column. You never tried to you know stay too close in a column for fear of. If something happened, you know, there's an opportunity to kill or maim more Marines. So you were spread out quite a bit, sometimes quite a ways. And that was always scary if you're on a tail end, uh, especially going up a mountain through a jungle and you think you can't see the guy ahead of you and you're scared to death to not keep up because, you know, the trail may turn and you may not. And so. Uh, those were were sometimes hard, but during the, the the daylight hours, it was usually moving into an area, surround a village. Somebody would, somebody from uh, above would um, make some kind of contact and then move out or dig in. Uh, oftentimes, it was dig in for the night. Dig in means dig in a foxhole in whatever terrain you could find that would protect you somewhat. Now, would the enemy probe your positions at night? Would they try to get in at you? Uh, they try. Um, uh, the, the, the things that we had uh, to, to prevent that were usually claymores, claymore mines, and, and just uh, two men in a foxhole uh, every I don't know, eight, ten yards from each other. Uh, sometimes these perimeters were larger, sometimes smaller. Uh, one guy always awake, the other guy gets a little bit of rest. Um, yeah, there, you could hear the noises and you could hear things rustling out there. Sometimes um, uh, the, 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 the lieutenants or captains would uh, get flares up and you could literally see out these parachute flares. <laughs> kind of scary actually and uh, the whole area would light up and you could see um, if it wasn't um, uh, brushy or jungle kind of stuff, you could see what's out there, or see any movement. Sometimes you you didn't want <laughs> what you saw. You didn't want to see because you knew they were there. Uh, but oftentimes it didn't mean you were going to have contact with them too. And, and would did you were you in a, you know camp at night and actually get a serious attack made on you, or were they just okay? no, never, never to the point where you thought you were going to get overrun or yeah, anything like yeah. that. Uh, there, we always, like you say, we always had um, uh, artillery and air. And I learned to call in air strikes and and give them coordinates, and they they were pretty good. Sometimes they were awfully close, but they were really good. So that usually drove off any kind of serious um, mm -hmm. um, uh, attack. Okay. Now, over the course of the 
to tour in Vietnam. Uh, how much downtime did you have? Did you have stand downs in bases or anything like that? No. Uh, it went, you know, there were the downtime meant you were actually able to take your boots off and maybe stretch out a little bit. Otherwise, you're pretty much in your boots all the time. Uh, your clothes are rotted, so sometimes you got a chance to get some new clothes. Uh, you, if you needed to see a, um, you know, like a, a medical uh, facility, like in Dong Ha, or uh, I think they had one at Camp Carroll too, um, as I did when my hand was infected, you could get things like that taken care of. You had a chance to write letters, um, uh, just play grab ass a little bit. Uh, sometimes it would fly. Uh, food in, otherwise it was sea rations most of the time. At Camp Carroll on a, on a Marine Corps birthday they brought in oh, they brought in helicopters with uh, turkey and, and uh, potatoes and stuff like that, and the cakes mm -hmm. for the birthday, um, and ammunition and mail. I think we were more concerned with ammunition and mail than we were with cakes. Mm -hmm. Rarely did we ever get any beer. Sometimes you got beer and pop. Falstaff, I think it was mm -hmm. at that time, or red, about white, as bad and blue, as you or, find. yeah, yeah, um, and it was always warm anyway. So I mean, some guys liked it, but it wasn't all that great. Sometimes you could get actually get a, a shower. They'd have these uh, big uh, balloons of water. It was always a cool shower, but nevertheless, you could soak down instead of walking in a stream and mm -hmm. trying to you know get get yourself cleaned up a little bit. Right. They mentioned getting mail. Your, your father was, was sending you out the, the lubricant for, for the weapons. What other kinds of things would they send you? Well, uh, things I asked for, and sometimes you, sometimes they arrived fairly quickly, 10 days or sometimes not, but it was the usual at that time. It was cookies or fudge or fruit cake, which nobody liked, um, sardines, cans of sardines, little those little I don't know if you can get them anymore, those little cooked canned hams. You peel the thing off and slice it up or whatever uh, to kind of complement the sea rations. Uh, socks, foot powder, um, mailing supplies like a pen or pencils and, and paper. Um, but, you, but the things that came in handy was the dry slide lubricant, the, the socks, and the uh, and uh, occasionally some cookies or something like that. Mm -hmm. But the, really, the, of, of all of that, the most important thing, and I, I think others that you have interviewed may say the same thing, the most important thing you got was ammunition and mail. Mm -hmm. Mail from home was gold. And then I, I was fortunate. I, my girlfriend, I think, re wrote me like at least once, sometimes two or three times a day. My parents would write. Uh, my mother got involved with the Marine Corps League and they would write, have kids send cards. Mm -hmm. So I'd always get a stack of mail like that. And I always felt bad because there were some guys that didn't get nothing, mm -hmm. absolutely nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, but it, I mean, you smell those envelopes and you, you feel them and, and read what's in them and it, it meant a lot to you. And, and it was probably the thing that, other than the ammunition, that kept you going. Right. In general, how would you evaluate the morale in your unit while you were with it? Good. Uh, I mean, there were times when uh, I, I think uh, rumors took over about uh, whatever NVA regiment was close, and, and all of a sudden everybody would get kind of freaky about that. But, uh, I mean, you toughen up quick, and you, you learn to do your job and to cover um, the guy with you or mm -hmm. sitting next to you or behind you or whatever. So um, morale was, was, I would say, really good. I think the lowest points are when people were dealing with the casualties, the injuries, and the, the dead. And you start to feel, um, you know, kind of bad. But, you know, uh, for you, life, you know, was still going on, and you had to do your job. Mm -hmm. So, How long was it before you began to feel like you were one of the old guys? Well, it seemed like never, you know. Okay. But um, it's, it's, you know, in time you, you do, you see other newer Marines coming into mm -hmm. the unit and you see what they, you know, they're carrying the, 
you know, hustling the, the stuff off the, the choppers, the ammunition to create some orders, the body bags, all the stuff that, you know, you get, the food, ammunition and stuff. Um, so you see the, the newer, younger, younger in most cases, Marines doing that. And you were able to kind of sit back and watch a little bit instead of being part of it. Uh, and then um, the, it was tough, though, in, in the sense that I, I don't think I had a second lieutenant for more than you know, a month or two at a time, uh, they were they were knocked off pretty quickly, and and or rotated elsewhere. Um, captains pretty much the same way. Uh, your leadership was always in, in a, a a change mode, so you really never got the, the kind of cohesion with leadership that 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 maybe people think you should, and the way I would have liked it. But on the other hand, um, you know, these are the, the new lieutenants are gung ho, sometimes to their fault. They, you know, they want to charge the hill and get themselves killed and all of that, and they want us to go with them. Um, and, but the captains were pretty. I mean, I, I don't think I had a bad lieutenant or captain. Mm -hmm. And I know some of the books I've read where, where that has always been true. Well, there were some of them. I mean, the captains probably often, if they're Marines, like we had been platoon leaders at some point already and might be in for a second tour, and yeah. so they might know something. Yeah. Uh, lieutenants, uh, would the good ones or the better ones, would they you know, try to talk to the NCOs and, and get a feel for things before throwing their weight around? Or? I, I, you know, I don't know, but I would hope they did. I, I think if, you, if, if the unit had a good... Uh, Gunny, if the unit had a good first sergeant, uh, or even uh, you know, some E5s that, that that had been around a while, that any any good leader would make sure they, you know, they talk to the to to that level uh, before you know they became too uh, gung ho. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, uh, I would hope. I I mean, I was never that close to the leadership that that. That I would know those things. Yeah, I guess you were you were still a PFC at the point when you got hit, right? Yeah. So no, I was corporal. Okay. I guess the I guess the news. I guess you showed me the document, Maybe. the, the telegram. Yeah, we had, we yeah I was PFC, PFC when I got hit. And yeah. I, they gave me a corporal, same time as the the Purple Heart. Mm -hmm. So, wow, wow, huh? Yeah. But, so, but at that point, you're not really in a leadership role. You're, you're just one of the men at that point. Okay. Um, oh, I was a squad. Uh, I was a team leader. Uh, which uh, under a squad mm -hmm. had three teams, and mm -hmm. I was a team leader of one of the squads, so I was moving up the ranks. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, are there, before the point when you got hit, are there other particular events or aspects of this experience that kind of stand out in your memory? Contien was bad. The rock pile was bad. Uh, walking into the being told you're in the across the DMZ was sort of made mm -hmm. you stop and think you know what's going to happen here it's not like a wall or anything you just walk across this field and you're in North Vietnam so to speak and then you're pretty much coming out of it but patrolling that area um, the, 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 the challenges besides the enemy the, the rain the mountains the climbing the 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 bugs, the snakes, you know, and bugs and snakes aren't any big deal. But when you're pulling leeches from your pecker, it's a big deal, you know. Mm -hmm. Leeches all over you, your legs, you know, up, up your body parts, and salt would get them off, lighter fluid would get them off. Sometimes you had to peel them off, but, I mean, it, it was constant. Mm -hmm. The 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 uh, the the foot, the feet, with uh, being wet all the time, became sore and tender, and uh, but you had to keep going. I mean, you had to. You didn't have any choice. Mm -hmm. You had to sometimes carry not only your own pack and ammunition and stuff, but somebody that was hit. You had to carry their gear too, or sometimes help them to get to a point where where you could um, wait for a medevac. I mean, those things. Those things were hard, and you know, when I look back at the so-called tough training in California, it was nothing to what you would face mm -hmm. 
there and what the things you had to do to, to, to survive. Right. Now, what made Contiana and the rock pile bad places? Was that just being close to the DMZ or? Terrain. Uh, the NVA 324B and C divisions, <laughs> for the most part, all over the place. Um, and, and constantly uh, digging in, constantly going out on patrols and, and hearing about that regiment that's out there. You know, it's going to get you um, day in, day out. So, uh, so mean, were they kind of playing a cat and mouse game with you? you absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, everybody's trying to outflank one another. Sometimes, uh, you know, you, you probably were passing them in, in a fairly short distance and not even knowing it. Um, uh, because they had other fights they wanted to fight, and we had places to be. Uh, I mean, so it wasn't. I mean, it wasn't like some of the World War II scenes where you're constantly shooting and fighting and mm -hmm. and all of that. You, you, you were pretty much on your feet, moving, moving from here to there, and patrolling here and there. Yeah, and you're not holding a continuous line no. against something. It's smaller units moving around. Never. In, Just in, the in, perimeter duty would be the closest thing to mm -hmm. to that. All right. Uh, now, um, so what, what, how did your tour get cut short? Uh, interesting enough, uh, sometime in, in late November, the rumor was that uh, the, the battalion was going to Fubai. And uh, Fubai was the southernmost uh, base, but it was also, uh, I think, where the 3rd Marine Division was at that time, the headquarters. And um, uh, so there are a lot of rumors, usually about the, the regiments that are out there that are going to get you, but um, the rumor was we were going to Fubai. So we worked our way back to Fubai on foot. Uh, it took a while. It took uh, all of the end of, end of um, November and into December, got to Fubai. And uh, even though it's a, a bigger city and more populated, it's close to Wei, which would be a later major battle. Um, never really had much contact with, with civilization, but our, our area covered a, an old French fort. So we had our so-called company headquarters in an old French fort, which was kind of cool. Some of the guys, I'm told, even had women brought in mm -hmm. uh, you know, and probably paid for it later. But um, so uh, to fill in the gaps on, on December, 14, I, I was sleeping under a tank in Fubai um, with some other guys because it was raining as usual. And um, But that night at uh, 11 o'clock or 2300 hours, we were heading out on a set up an ambush. And so it got up. Uh, this was an ambush where you couldn't, you didn't wear flak jackets, you didn't wear helmets, you just wore a soft boonie hat. Uh, camouflage on, on your body uh, and uh, what ammunition you could carry but nothing that would make noise. So off we went, set up our ambush uh, to set up our ambush and on the way uh, we were ambushed and the booby trap set it off and it was a big firefight uh, for a small group like nine or ten of us as I recall. And uh, the first two guys in that ambush were killed, and I was number three. I was injured, and the guy behind me, or somewhere by me, was injured pretty badly. He had his throat cut open with shrapnel, and he was bleeding pretty bad. And so we, to the extent we could, uh, got ourselves a little perimeter area and shot back. Um, and as quick as it started, it, it broke off. Um, the uh, sergeant got a uh, got on a radio, or I think the, we had a radio man at that time. We didn't always have one with us, so we had a radio man. Uh, they called in a medevac, and I, I mean, I could hear him talking, but I, I was hurt bad enough that I couldn't function. I could hold a rifle, but half of my rifle wasn't was blown apart, mm -hmm. so I thought I was holding a rifle, but it wasn't all there. And um, I didn't know the extent of my injuries. I couldn't see good, and 
I knew I was hurt in the arm. Uh, I knew um, my stomach was burning up, and uh, and right then and there, the new corpsman, his first patrol with us, showed up and put some morphine in my leg and told me um, everything was going to be okay. And I didn't know how bad I was hit, mm -hmm. but it seemed like forever, but uh, they got a medevac in. I saw the yellow smoke they got out there to get the chopper in. And I can remember getting on my feet and trying to get to that chopper. And uh, they helped me get to that chopper quickly. And I remember laying um, on that chopper, that medevac, an old a CH-34, I guess it is, one of the old mm -hmm. Marine Corps helicopters, and um, laying there between dead and wounded and um, thinking this is not, it's taken forever and I'm cold, I'm freezing cold. And, um, and so, but we got off and it seemed like forever to get where we were going. I, you're not here to look at this stuff, but this is what shrapnel does to you, right? Um, and uh, so they took me to Charlie Med in Da Nang, uh, the, the medical facility there. And I remember being offloaded. I remember being on this stretcher on sawhorses outside, and they're, they're stripping, they're cutting away your clothes, and their corpsmen are doing whatever they were doing to, to keep you stable. And I can remember clearly the, them talking as I lay there about whether or not they were going to take my arm off. And I, I'm thinking really bad things. But uh, so then they got me into inside and they did some surgeries. And I was shot through here, came out here as well. That was the burning in my stomach, so they did a laparotomy, and I think that's what it was called from here to here, mm -hmm. a zipper, and cleaned me up and did what they had to do. And the next thing I knew, I woke up. I didn't know where I was. I could see round windows, and that I was hurt on the 14th of December around midnight. And it was the 16th of December when I woke up, and they told me I was on the USS Repose in the South China Sea. So there I had some surgeries and uh, was on a, a rack with a Korean Marine to my head side, and he was in awful pain and the screaming on both sides, people wanting Demerol, uh, just screaming and hollering, and it was awful, so to speak, and I, I found that I needed every four hours to get the Demerol, too, mm -hmm. so, uh, and they did some, they tried to graft some skin off my legs, and this area here, and this leg, too, or thigh, and put it on here, and, and they had it soaking in what I was told was aqua pen or something like that, some kind of a penicillin, but the, the, the grafts would never take. So I have these gaps, you know, mm -hmm. of, of, I guess it's skin or something yeah. on it, but the grafts would never take well. So after 31 days, they did what they could with me, and I went to the Naval Hospital in Yokohama, Japan, and I, in a ward, across from the screams and and the pain that the amputees were facing just down the hall from me. It was awful. And I stayed in Japan at that hospital for a little over a month and then headed back to the States. You know, during your time on the repose or in Japan, were you able to get up and walk around at all or towards the end on the on the repose I was able to, they actually took a picture of me hanging onto the rail mm -hmm. uh, and getting some fresh air. Um, and uh, I can remember uh, the nurses on that ship were wonderful. And I can remember this 
when it was time to go, they wrap you up and put you in kind of a, a bundle, and, and then they get you to the, to the place where the choppers come and go. And I can remember this one nurse, she was very pretty, actually, um, giving me a kiss, and away I went. So there's one detail I didn't tell you. Okay. Uh, and you asked me a while back about what did I get in the mail, and mm -hmm. uh, well, I had asked for, and I got. I asked my dad to send me a, a 38 caliber pistol, um, a snub nose, which he did do, and I got it. And I was never going to be captured. It was a shoulder holster, and I, you're not supposed to have them. It was illegal, actually, but I had my. 38 uh, with me the night I got hurt and when they saw that uh, I, I think their eyes lit up because as it turned out a, I hate to say it a gunnery sergeant took it mm -hmm. and confiscated it but kept it mm -hmm. and what was really bad was um, on the repos I got this wooden box package and I couldn't I mean I could hardly move let alone you know, open a wooden box, so they opened it for me, and guess what was in the box? Ammunition? 38 caliber ammunition, and they're wondering why I, I was getting it, and then, you know, I thought I was in big trouble, and they said, well, what do you want us to do with it? And I, I said, throw it out over the side, or you know, get rid of it. I don't need it now, but I did want to follow through on that 38, and as it turned out, uh, the gunnery sergeant who is in the picture that I showed you on the repos is the guy that that took it. So when I got back to a hospital, I tried to get in contact with him, and I wasn't able to do that. Mm -hmm. So my dad was uh, having problems because he said if anyone was ever killed with that weapon that was traced back to him, you know, he could be in trouble, mm -hmm. so, but we never did get the 38 back. Well, but, all right. Right. Uh, now the time you're in Japan, are you able to kind of get around and do more? Yeah, yeah, well, do more was, uh, I don't remember much of it, but you were able to walk around the, the in the area, yeah. um, including a, like an outside deck uh, where you could sit in a chair with a lot of other uh, men that were hurt, um, and it was at at that point that something else good happened. My dad had signed up for a program with what was then Union Bank, and the bank would pay for calls overseas. Mm -hmm. So it was set up, and I forget the time differences, but while I was in Japan, I was able to talk to my mother and dad. Um, and there's another side story to all this that I didn't share with you. When I was when I was in Da Nang on that laying there and they hauled me in, uh, they they were trying I remember the colonel's asking me the colonel from the second battalion, Ninth Marines, is there asking me questions about what happened and I can remember turning and just barfing probably on him or close to him. I had beef steak and potatoes that night, mm -hmm. sea rations. And then the next thing I remember is the priest, Catholic priest, giving me the last rites, which wasn't a good sign at that time. And the next thing I remember was a guy, well, the voice said, don't worry, I'll talk to your parents. I mean, what the hell is this? Well, as it turned out, the, the colonel's driver uh, was a Marine by the name of Mazzarelli from Grand Rapids. And uh, I forget if it's Rich or Ray, they're two brothers. Um, but anyhow, he, you know, I later found out who that was because he had access to some kind of communication mm -hmm. that they talked to my parents in Grand Rapids, uh, which was surprising. And after I got home or on leave, I guess it was, uh, my dad took me to see the Mazzarelli family and they owned what was then the bowling alley on Plainfield Avenue. And so I had a chance to to, to spend some time with the, the Mazzarelli family. And as it turned out, um, he, he was a friend. He went to Catholic Central, I went to West Catholic, but he was a friend of mine. He was a friend of a friend of mine. And I got a call one night that says it was a leader in a 
financially sound company. It was bought out by a conglomerate in Atlanta who had a history of milk in the company and spinning it off. Mm -hmm. Their name is Fuqua Industries. And uh, uh, so uh, Interstate was spun off and had to make it on its own during a time in the 70s, the late 70s, when there was a recession, when the fuel crisis hit, mm -hmm. when tires and rubber were expensive. The Teamsters Union wouldn't make any concessions, and all of those things led to a to a, a bankruptcy. And uh, it was there that I didn't know what I was going to do. I could stay in trucking, but move to North Carolina or to California. I could have had some mm -hmm. pretty good jobs uh, out of this. Uh, my wife at that time, and still my wife, we had kids in school. We decided we weren't going to relocate, but I didn't know what I was going to do. So um, in the process of the interstate bankruptcy, I got to the federal courthouse here in Grand Rapids on a, uh, at least once a week because of some of the documents I had custody of that, that had to be brought and, and explained. Um, and it was there that uh, uh, in the courthouse, my sister happened to work for a congressman there, and she said, go see so-and-so. His name was John Smetanka. And he was the United States attorney in Western Michigan at that time. And so John Smetanka and his supervisors interviewed me twice. And I got a call and said, would you like to be our first uh, administrative officer in this district? Uh, at that time, there were like uh, eight or nine attorneys and 12 support staff. And uh, uh, almost 29 years later, when I left, uh, we had uh, just under 50 attorneys and, and about 55 support staff. So it was a period of growth, and not only in Grand Rapids, but opened an office in Marquette, in Lansing, Kalamazoo, uh, branch offices. Uh, so I had a, a, a great opportunity to work with some great hard work and mm -hmm. federal employees, contrary to what people believe. Um, and um, so I retired uh, recently, and, and uh, um, I miss the people, don't miss the work. Mm -hmm. uh, now I can do things like this. Right. Um, but uh, I, I had a, a, a great run you know, after a, what could have been a, a terrible outcome. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in and sharing your story today. You're welcome. I, I appreciate what you're doing with this project. Uh, Vietnam vets don't always get a good uh, um, a view uh, from the, the, the public. and, and uh, uh, I just want to say that, you know, uh, we served our country, and I think we did it well. I never seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile, and there wasn't a building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. If I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done.